Hello, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This webinar is organised by the British Association of Social Workers. It is about social work with autistic people through COVID-19 and beyond. My name is Gottfried Bauerhin and I have great pleasure in being the moderator for today's webinar. I'm delighted to be joined on the panel by three experts in autism. The first is Matthew Bushell, who is a manager of the Kent Specialist Autism Service. Matthew will talk about the changes that have occurred in practice and in services because of COVID-19. The second panelist is Sylvia Stanway, an autistic self-advocate and a mother of an autistic child. Sylvia has asked me to tell you, our audience, that she has a different understanding of verbal cues and would therefore need me to tell her when it's time for us to move on to a different topic or for us to move on to a different speaker. So if you hear me or notice Sylvia and I having that interaction, it's something that we've agreed beforehand. And in, in, in a way, I think what Sylvia and I will be doing throughout this webinar is replicating and also modeling what we know to be the most effective ways of communicating with autistic people. And that will be discussed later on within the webinar. Our final panelist is Dr. Philip Hessler, who is an academic at Northumbria University. And Philip is one of the very few social work researchers writing about autism. So this panel has a breadth of experience in research, in practice, and also in lived experience. And so I am confident that what they will say will be really useful to, to you, irrespective of the role that you have in services with autistic people. And I'm delighted to know that we have a range of professionals in services with, um, around autism joining us this afternoon. So before I hand over to Matthew, I want to highlight two important contexts to the webinar. The first is that this webinar has been organized by the Baswa Special Interest Group on Autism and Learning Disability. Within Baswa, special interest groups are led by Baswa members who have particular interest in specific areas of social work. And special interest groups exist for Baswa members to really promote good practice, to promote the voice of people with lived experience, to support research, and also to influence policy on autism. So if you are a Baswa member and you are interested in joining an, a special interest group, such as the Special Interest Group on Learning Disability and Autism, then please feel free to contact me after this webinar. A second context to this webinar is that between 2018 and 2019, the Department of Health and Social Care commissioned Baswa to develop two practice frameworks. And those practice frameworks you can see on your screen now. The first practice framework was around social work with adults working with adult, social workers working with adults with learning disability. And the second one was social work with autistic adults. These, these practice frameworks were co-produced with people with lived experience, and they both highlight the centrality of relationship-based practice, human rights, and skillful knowledge in social work practice in autism and learning disability. So even while COVID has caused such a radical change in how social work is practiced and how organ services for autistic people are organized, 
I believe and I'll strongly argue that there are core yeah. and timeless social work values around practice with autistic adults and also people with learning disabilities. And those timeless values are really the embodiment of good social work practice. And those are contained in the practice frameworks that I have discussed. So all three of our panelists today were involved in the development of the capability statements for social work with autistic adults. And they will welcome the opportunity to share their knowledge with you and also discuss this important work with you. We really would welcome you to be engaged in the discussion. We really want to hear your thoughts. We really want to hear your comments. And we also want you to challenge the ideas of our panelists. So please be engaged, be involved, and send us your questions using the right hand button on your screen. And so we also encourage you to tweet about the webinar. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. I will now hand over to Matthew, who would give us the first presentation. To you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Godfrey. Thank you, Godfrey. And it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, to uh, pass on my observations, really. I, I, I struggle sometimes with the word expert, but, you know, I work in an, I manage an autism team and I get to uh, hear, you know, all the, all the good work that goes on in social work and um, some of my professional colleagues and uh, hear from a lot of families. And um, so hopefully I've got something to, something of value to pass on to everyone today. Um, so it does feel like the world's changed in six or seven weeks, really, and it's no more so in social work. And um, is we had to radically rethink how we how we work with people essentially because we can't go out to everybody on, on the visits that we normally do we're essentially only doing urgent visits and safeguarding at the moment um there's other parts of social work and like children's statutory visits where people have to go out more but and mental health assessments but in the autism team and we got to quite a balanced situation at the moment of um of, uh, of online work and it's, it's opened our eyes really to how uh, we can work in future with some people. There's still a need for visits and face to face, no doubt about it. But we we used to visit people regularly, you know, for any any good reason, all throughout the county of Kent. It's a massive place, and um, and really, you love time wasted on motorways and stuff. We really could have just done more with people. And um, so, in, in in relation to how I've um, researched this particular subject, I've talked to about. I probably talked to people who have been involved with about 6,000 families in Kent uh, for different reasons in an autism collaborative. So we have uh, charitable organisations so are in touch with quite a few thousand families. And then we have um, advocacy agent and uh, educational and academic and uh, lots of different people are on our uh, health and social care are on our uh, autism collaborative. So that's a question of them, you know, how's the world change really around um, support we provide to autistic adults particularly? And um, so I've got quite a few viewpoints back. So I've, I'm trying to think best way to explain um, what we've observed. And I, I do apologize if it sounds like I'm making generalizations because it's hard to generalize from one autistic adult to the next. But there are themes. So if you just excuse the fact that I've tried to pick up some things and um, people might come back to me and go, this isn't true for a number of people, but I'm just trying to put some of the positives and negatives of what COVID has impacted upon our client group and how we in social work and associate um, partners have uh, been able to respond. So if I move on to the kind of positives and negatives, if, if I don't think it's any surprise to anyone, uh, some of the negatives really are um, the mental health side of things, is uh, uh, the isolation, anxiety. For some people, compounded um, people's sense of uh, emotional well-being and mental health. Uh, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody and it's well, well documented. Um, but actually, in Kent, we've seen a lesser number of people than we would expect. Um, quite a lot of our clients are actually doing very well in their families. And there's probably reasons why, which I can go into in a little bit. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, everyone's exactly the same, no generalizations here. I'm just saying that some of the people are most affected because their mental health has deteriorated through this, through this period. And there's also, if we're honest as well, there's also an aspect of, um, I, it's hard to say really, Challenging things to support really within the family environment. I don't like to use the words domestic violence or children be It's all very loaded terms, but uh, have a have a context around them. And quite often that context could be sensory related issues. It could be the pressures of 
of living together as a family in this particular isolated situation. There's all sorts of reasons why people might struggle, but I think some of the families have really struggled. It's been um, it's been very hard for everyone in the family to to contain the the concerns from each person and to live as a cohesive unit. But they're the minority, really. They're the minority we found. We support a thousand people in the Kent team, and um, there's about we've had about four and a half thousand people that we've met in the last ten years. So the minority of people, I would say, are struggling because we we contact people on a on a periodic basis on a sort of priority list of um, checks, telephones. At the moment, we're contacting about four to five hundred people every one or three weeks, and um, and there's a smaller number, much smaller amount of people are struggling than there are now. And I wonder if that is an, autis an autism specific thing or whether that's the same in, in all parts of society. And it's hard to say, all I can speak for is the people I know and we support. So if I move on quickly, I thought it's best explaining the, some of the ways we've adapted in, in the spell methodology. I'm sure quite a lot of you know about the spell methodology and I'll explain it as we go on. A spell basically is S-P-E-L-L. -L. And I'll go through what the different letters mean if people don't know as I start to explain this um, presentation. So the first one, probably most important one really, is structure. And um, so regardless of COVID, it's always, it's, it's well known that quite a lot of, our, of the people we support, the autistic adults in your families and people you support, are um, really do benefit from the structure, like we all do in life. And and COVID has, has kind of like put a bit of a kibosh on some of the structure um, for some people. Uh, there was a time for a few weeks where we was uh, we, autistic adults were only allowed out once uh, for exercise like anybody else and um, some may have gone to do the daily shops some may not have. but that luckily that has been uh, that has been extended a little bit in the last couple of weeks has been a greater um, easement of, the, of, of that particular area of government guidance on social isolation so um, ideally with a support plan within a support plan people autistic people can access a community more than just one stay for exercise. So that's, that's been a positive. But that structure has been has been quite an impact, in fact, uh, on some of my clients. And we've managed to mitigate that through working with people on, on devising a structure within the home and a uh, limited outside activity. And the ways we've been able to do that is through um, some of the technology and um, through telephone. But the technology particularly, some of it's been amazing. Um, we've We've been able to use some some particular pieces of care. We've got a particular thing called Cara, which is a Kent-based a Kent system, which is an online system. We've also used uh, something called Abilia, which comes from Scandinavia, and it allows you to put, to put a structure into your day, and it allows um, people, um, people who are supporting that person, could be even people in the home, um, amending the structure to, to, and prompt people to do stuff. And some of the clients we've seen, they really struggled mentally and you know, sort of emotional well-being without a structure. When we put this in, I've really benefited from it uh, to have that structure. And sometimes the things that we've um, we put in on the most complex things is about taking a break or doing a fun activity or doing a washing up or everyday things involved in the house. But to have that structure down and to work through our structure has helped a lot of people. And um, we're really pleased by that. And we've, we've really sort of turned some crisis situations around uh, through that in, in line with our occupational therapists as well, because our occupational therapists are particularly good at meaningful activity and structures. And I noticed there's been quite a lot of innovation is um, lo locally about, uh, need regionally about uh, things that people have tried to do to try and put structure in. And I see there's a National Autistic Society, Day Support, they made a McDonald's frontage and distributed burgers. And I thought that's quite a good idea, really, because those sort of things can be really, really important. To some of my clients, some of the people we support, and some of my family members. It's just those everyday things are no longer available to us. And, and as regards structure as well, I think there's something around. Um, the people who have, have done okay during COVID, it's, it's, in some ways, the, the rules of society are less ambiguous in some ways, aren't they, when you think about it. But, and someone said to me earlier when I was talking to my team about the presentation I'm about to make, I said, is there any tidbits you can give me? And, and this man said to me, a uh, social worker, he said to me, I've got three clients with ADHD and autism, and they've all said that life is more simple. And actually, the stresses and the sensory of everyday life, the chaotic way we've lived our lives up to COVID, it actually makes my ADHD worse. Having life more simple is how my autism and my ADHD, because it's more controllable situations. So I move on now to positive approaches. And again, I think this, this idea of a slower pace of life, I think has helped uh, 
quite a lot of our clients not to be in crisis. And, and as time goes on, I'm sure things will increase, but we're hoping sometime in the future there'll be more, more guidance from the government. So it's not always easy um, to keep positive and to have positive strategies and support to um, the people we support and to autistic adults to self-manage. And um, a lot of our clients, you know, again, I'm generalizing, a lot of our clients are quite good on the internet and um, and some of them don't sleep at night because they're talking to people in America about their interests and playing games and all sorts of things. And and there's something in there really, something that is sort of, I think is maintaining some of the clients that we see's mental well-being is that they, a lot of people we see, a lot of these youngsters, 18 plus, uh, have got quite a good understanding of uh, how to socialize um, on the computer. And um, and also to access apps and online support. So there's anxiety apps and um, there's also apps for every type of situation really. And there's also the counseling and psychology and, and, the, and the other types of interventions are done online now. And I think it's something that we're going to think about in the future about it needs to be evaluated. Is, is there any loss in doing that? And then there will be in some cases, and in some, some cases there won't. And actually, it's a good, it's a good way of communicating with my client group, and an economical way. You get more for your buck. Uh, the psychologist who's on online talking to 20 people could see much more people than traveling to see somebody or coming to a clinic potentially. So there is there's certain advantages in this, and um, and I think the other thing, the other positive thing, I think, around the way the social work has to adapt really to the change situation we're in at the moment is that we need to let go a little bit of um, some of the traditionally held notions that the only way to do work is to visit people, to go through the assessment, to give our signature, to do, you know, there are ways and means of doing stuff. You don't have to keep visiting people all the time necessarily. But, but then you also got to balance out against trust. A lot of people we see have, have, have lost trust with professionals and they may have come into adulthood having been in their mind let down by children's services and, you know, again, another generalization. So can you do that online so much? It's, but, there are ways, there are ways, and in some cases you can. And um, also we need to be more trusting of um, self-assessment and trusting the family carers. And and I think this is a, I know Sky have recently given some advice on the best ways to assess during a COVID period. And they mentioned those two things, that self-assessment should be even more pronounced uh, and encouraged and supported. And so should the viewpoints of uh, family carers who sometimes get isolated from assessment processes and yeah, Social workers only seeing someone for an hour here and there and to do assessments and to keep in touch or to provide a package of care. But family there 24 hours a day sometimes, or if not, the person's living on their own, visiting, contacting them regularly. Their viewpoint is very valid. And I think this is a chance for us to refocus and say, you know, actually, have we given enough credence to the opinion of family carers? Um, and the isolation side of it can be positive and negative. So. Someone in, in Advocacy for All, which one of our particular charitable providers said to me, uh, my worry is, is a lot of people are doing very well on the computer, but actually long term, would that be the people, some of the clients they're worried about, would they opt out of um, then challenging themselves to go uh, into society and socialize more in a face to face because it's easier sometimes to talk on the computer. So I don't know, is that a factor or not? It's just something that someone said to me, but it could be, it could be a factor of some people might get quite quite rigid and fixed in the idea of online only sort of thing because we've been forced to do so for so many weeks that let's carry on. And then, so moving on, the empathy side of things. Um, I think the emphatic the emphatic knowledge that we're gaining from living together, where we are living in families, not everyone lives in families, but where we are living together with people, whether it's group houses or whatever, more than ever, we're having to accommodate the viewpoints of other people and um, and find ways of managing. Otherwise, we're just being chaos and in crisis with each other the whole time. So I think we're kind of forced to, all of us are forced to challenge um, the emphatic side of things about trying to understand other people's viewpoints and put ourselves in, the, in other people's shoes. And I think in social work, we need to understand, you know, how it is for the people we support and um, and try and see it from their viewpoint and the carers as well. So. I think this empathy thing is is being severely challenged, and there's no there's no doubt, you know, this this stupid myth about um, autistic people have a lack of empathy. It's not a lack of empathy. It's just a, it's, it's it's empathy. It's a different way of empathising. So a lot of clients with have been concerned about the book that doesn't get read or or some other things, and it, it's different. But you know, really care about people, care about animals, and and it's not empathy in that sense. It's around empathy in in relation to understanding other people's behaviours and you know this sort of central coherence and fear in mind and all that about understanding the um how to 
relate to other people in the challenge world in a different world we live in now and um and being quite a lot of work online actually does challenge that a little bit but actually it's positive i think it's positive about adapting and um and better understanding um what we need from people from us and then the other part of spell is uh the two hours is lower arousal and and that's been a benefit in some ways for a lot of people um it's it's a for, the pace of the world before we got to COVID was, was getting ridiculous, wasn't it, really? The, the, the frenzy of the way we live our lives and um, and the things we worry about, whether someone likes our Facebook page and things, you know, and you just, and you think, thank God we've slowed down. I, I You know, it's horrible it's come to a tragedy like this to come to it, but actually what can we learn from this situation? But yeah, a lot of our clients really benefit from a lower rise environment. Now, living together with family members and other people might have needs and everything can be quite stressful. And the anxiety of worrying about people being ill in the family is very stressful. But what can we learn from from this situation about how we can help people to live in a more lower arousal world? And I think in social work, I think we've got a good chance to reflect on what's been happening in the last seven weeks. Think about how we can best plan around around arousal and sensory overload and things like that, and how we can put sensory breaks in and things. Working with my the occupational therapist colleagues, we're actually doing sensory assessments online as well, which is really amazing. We're able to um, uh, have people walk around the house and explain the way that people are um, struggling to accommodate sensory need, and um, and we've we've managed to actually uh, reduce some crises through that as well, and uh, to do some online work with our colleagues. So whatever social workers do, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be isolated. It should be in collaboration with families and the people we support and other professionals as well. And that's where we get the best value of our uh, interventions and our support. And um, I've already talked about. Um, yeah, sensory breaks. So moving on. And one of the best things that's happened in Ken is, is the Autism Collaborative. It used to always be this meeting we used to have, and we never really achieved much. But I think the online meetings we have now once a week, we really do achieve stuff. We really get a collaborated viewpoint of what, what's going to help people. So recently we've been getting them, um, we've been talking about grab and go um, hospital passports. So a minor version, a lesser version of hospital passport. Someone suddenly found out in the hospital that um, it would give the hospital an idea of what they might need in hospital. And um, we're able to share that across our different groups to maybe touch 7,000 families, you know. And we've got a, we've managed to get a letter and um, a key fob as well that's allowed to Kent, with the Kent police to understand why some of our times are allowed out more than once. So they don't get questioned and that then really released, reduces the anxiety of this. And um, so I've got, we've got loads of uh, good examples of where we've helped, helped families. And, um, and the other thing that uh, the collaborative does is got, we've got a service user group there and, and they're able to uh, help us to uh, evaluate and, and research things in the future. So I think that is going to be really valuable because I think we've got a lot to learn from, from this period. And, um, and I don't, until it dust sails a little bit, it's hard to know, you know, if uh, things are as positive as I kind of think they are, not dismissing, but there's a small number of smaller number of clients who are actually quite severely affected but i think a lot of our clients are managing and i think all of the things i described is the reasons why and i think it's people have been people live in, this is a less sensory world it's a less arousal world is online isn't a, isn't a ridiculous concept for some people to to uh, talk about some people have made friendships with people from across across the uh, atlantic and all over the world uh, online and they need our help and um, and I think um, by being together, by being stuck in cocoons of, of, uh, with other people, I think we've had to, people have had to challenge themselves around um, the empathy side of understanding other people and trying to find resolutions and negotiations around how we live without being in each other's throats all the time. So I just so I just um, those are the things I wanted to pass over today. But when I was thinking about about um, how social work's changed, I think it quite neatly fits into the spell framework. And um, I would recommend people have a good think about that in, in, in the counties where you live to see if um, some of those um, SPL hours is, is ticked, you know, we've got it in our heads and, and linking to the country framework as well, which is brilliant. Uh, and uh, it's going to help us all. Thank uh, you. But also, I also question one last thing. There was a question where, sorry, um, got for us. question for the specialist autism team has helped us to be on top of supporting people enough and whether if it wasn't a specialist autism team in Ken, whether things would be more difficult. That's just our pace that I'm not saying everything's rosy. It's not at all. But you know, there's a lot more positives than I thought there maybe over this period. Thank you, Matthew. This is this is a, a theme that I'm sure we'll discuss 
um, later mm. on in, 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 in their webinar. Thanks very much for that uh, wonderful overview of how, how social work can respond to, to, to the challenge of COVID. And I think it's important for us to bear in mind that actually there are positives and also uh, some challenges and we need to yeah, definitely. carefully analyze both of them. What I want to do now then is um, I want to move on to um, Sylvia and, and I'll be grateful Sylvia if you could share with us your thoughts on, on your experiences through, throughout this period. Right. Um, I'm Sylvia. Um, I'm in my 40s at some point. I don't actually remember how old I am. I have to ask my husband. And as you can see, I've got uh, two children. They do tend to wander in and out, but the best way is just for me to give them a hug and let them move off. But they're both um, autistic. Um, uh, my daughter has also diagnosed a pathological demand avoidance. And my son at the moment has... Um, uh, autism learning some learning difficulties and a demand of and he's demand avoidant but he's not been diagnosed with PDA so our household is um, very diverse so there's three of us that uh, have quite specific needs my husband is not autistic but he is an engineer so he has quite a good left brain as I call it he's he's, he's um, easily translatable and what we've found um, through the COVID is my, my daughter is very happy to hibernate. So the loss of her short breaks, the short break used to give us a chance so that we could go out and parent the, our son, Alexander, um, who wants to go out and our daughter doesn't want to go out. So for her, she's pretty much just gone into hibernation. Um, she has some good links with school. So, and they're allowing her, she's in a very small school, about 23 pupils, and they're allowing her to choose what work she does. And mentally, she's, she's pretty holding it together. So um, that, that's a blessing. And uh, for her, COVID isn't too much of an issue. Um, she's got the cat and she's got everything she needs. Whereas for my, my son, he, we have an allotment that we could go to but he won't go because it reminds him of everything that he can't do. So we have no um, PA support for him or short break for him. Um, he is refusing to do anything that's available, even go out for a walk because it reminds him of what he can't have. And he's hugely, hugely demanding. So I mean, at the moment, my husband's not working uh, today. He has today off so I can do this and he can support um my son while i'm while i'm well, our son while i'm on this and uh it's been really challenging and it's made me really appreciate the bit of social care that we do get it's not enough what we get but it's really made me appreciate it i mean the other night he um he got so uh anxious that he pulled a knife um and this has happened before um and you know he's not a horrible kid it's just we're so tired because we haven't had a break our levels of managing his levels um, our humanity came through we weren't as low aroused or low demand as we could have been and it's really really tricky isn't it so i mean he does spend a lot of time on the computer and to be honest for him that's a good way of socializing um, if he's safe, I leave him alone. I often have to sit with him to make sure he's safe on the computer and that he's um, not in communication with unsafe people. Um, and if if that was all he wanted to do, um, it would I would not be challenging him to go beyond that because I think when you can't tolerate demands, for me, I, I struggle with demands. When you can't tolerate demands, living in your daily life, having to manage what you manage, if you can find a safe space to be that allows you to be free, because we need freedom. And my son's freedom is either, at the moment it's airsoft, he likes to run around shooting things at airsoft. And that's what he can't do and it's driving him mad. Um, he won't allow us to set a shooting range up in the garden. As I said, it's 
because it's it's not the demand of it is it's just not enough he 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 can't do the airsoft so he can't do anything else and um and i think what we have to be really careful about is that we recognize people's limits so for my daughter she actually has previously spent a year in her room because she was unable to function in her last school and i didn't push her outside of that she needed that to decompress and i think Matthew's point on computer is, do we push them outside of that or do we leave them? Well, actually, I'd say if someone's safe, if they're communicating in their way and they're in their flow state, a flow state is like freedom to us. It's The demands are gone. We're actually attached to what we're doing. So we feel free. If that doesn't make sense, please put um, a question in and I'll, I'll elaborate on it. Yeah. But that yeah. sense of Sylvia, it's Godfrey here, and, and I think you, you made a really important point. What I, there, there are audience, I'm sure, would be professional social workers who are having to respond to this yeah. situation, which yeah. is unprecedented, and I'm sure some of them would want to know or want yeah. to hear how they can respond to what you need from them as a result of this unprecedented situation. So what what can be done to make things better for you and your child at this particular time what how can social workers respond to you appropriately at this time recognize we don't have our freedom okay we don't have our freedom it may look like um a lot of demands and stuff are taken away but we don't have our freedom because we can't do what makes us feel free um, I feel very lucky as I, my allotment is something that makes me feel free and I am getting an hour a day at the moment. It's not enough, but it, I, I can cope with that. But for my son, it's airsoft. For my daughter, it's being in. But you, you have to look at what makes a person feel free. So for someone could be being on the computer, for someone else, it could be, um, I don't know, running. And we don't having certain foods, having certain interests, whatever it is, it could be watching videos of people squeezing spots. It's whatever that person needs to feel, to do to feel safe and free. I, I need to be in charge. If I'm not in charge, I don't feel safe. Um, so a lot of this COVID has taken a lot of control away from me for stuff. And I find that really difficult. What I have found really good is um we're still getting our food deliveries um i'm not having to socialize with people i'm really enjoying that i'm really enjoying not having to socialize with people and i'm enjoying um i mean i'm enjoying the weather and I'm, I'm enjoying growing things but i'm still not able to facilitate what my children need so that's really challenging we've lost all our social care um uh, as i said because of the covid um, um so a lot of people look at us and think well they've got food they're safe in their house and that's fine but then they can't understand why our levels of anxiety mm -hmm. are up here mm -hmm. and it's because we haven't got what we need to nourish us and sustain us and what people need is different there are different levels of necessity so it's great that in some places autistic people are being allowed out more than once a day because they're recognizing that that's nourishing but there's other stuff that people need for nourishment and I think you have to look at your once you've met one autistic person you've met one autistic person we are all different and you have to look at your individual and you have to say what do they need for nourishment and it's not just food it's not just um that they're safe that's really important but what ticks them along uh and it's really important because when you take that away you take someone's freedom away and you take what they need away godfrey yeah, am well, i digress no no i think i think you 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 what you're telling us is really informative but i'm sure what our audience would also want to know is how would a social worker be able to find out or assess what you need right. at this particular time can you give us some tips about what social workers should do really to do yes. in yes. order to I achieve think... effective assessments with with yes. with you and your family 
at this that time. Was my, that was my next thing. And thank you for, for putting me back on track. Um, Matthew talked about believing us and more assessments that see us as the expert and see people that know us really well as the expert and believing us because there's so much, um, this is a word that not everybody likes, but it happens. There's a lot of gaslighting and gatekeeping going on and there's a lot of tick boxing and there's a lot of onus on us to conform to what's available rather than having um, an individual approach saying what the principle of this is what's right for the individual and then challenging those budgets and, and making something work rather than uh, I have a shape sorter in my brain and I've often felt like the shape sorter has all circles and I might be um, a star and they're trying to whack me in to the circle and I don't fit and I think most of us feel like that so Godfrey I know you want me to just come back to the point and the point is when you come to us He's giving me the face. I know I've got to follow the face. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, that's the good. Um, so we're coming back to the point is when you talk to us, find out how we communicate. I've got my own support worker um, who is unable to see me at the moment and she would know to communicate with me via email. Someone in her company keeps phoning me out the blue. I hate talking on the phone. Um, so when they say, are you all right? I'm going, I've got food, I've got a house, and my husband's mowing the lawn, bye. It's kind of like, just get them off the phone. Whereas if they were to email me and say, do you need anything? Do we need to have a talk? Then I would probably be more forthcoming rather than panicking because there's someone on the phone. Mm. Um, and then there's other things is like, believe us. Um, you may observe that we're coping in something but actually what's going into that and don't assume that because we coped in in that area that we'd cope in another area it's it's about believing us and being flexible around us and not putting the onus on us to fit in a lot of people put the onus on us to fit in and i think what really annoys me is if you get someone that you can't get on with and you've got when, when my rigid brain kicks in and I've decided someone's a moron, that's never going to, they're never going to be able to help me. So and you know, then I'd need someone to not just sign me off, to bring someone who has the skills to communicate with me. Okay, would, Sylvia, Sylvia, thank you. There's a question which is really related to the point you've just made. And I think it probably is a good time to, okay. to ask okay. because it follows on from what you've just said. So the question from, from uh, someone listening to this webinar is, what do we as a panel think about blanket rules being applied to, to, to everyone? Um, can, shall I just start with that? Blanket yeah, rules are rubbish. Blanket rules are rubbish. Blanket, it's like um, trying to fit a square peg into a round hole a blanket rules are damaging when you try and say to someone right we've got this so we're going to fit you into that i actually think inappropriate care is worse than no care and i'm mm. gonna i can see philip having a thought in his brain so i'll stop now i think you've got something to say there haven't you phil am i right let me let me let me okay, ask yes matthew, philip let me ask matthew first and then i'll okay. come to you and then you can do your presentation as well. Okay. So Matthew, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So Matthew, do you, yeah, do you have any thoughts on um, on the question from uh, a, a, a member of the audience saying, what, what do we as a panel think about blanket rules being applied to, 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 to everyone? And as people may have individual and very personal routines. Yeah, it's difficult. It's a difficult question. That's the problem. What they have said is, you know, two weeks ago they allowed, um, they made concessions, didn't they, for autistic adults to to at least get out in the community a bit more for for therapeutic well-being reasons. And I think that's quite an achievement, really, in a situation like this to have a recognition. So that's probably what I'd say is that 
there has been some concession and also I know from Ken Police, they've, they've, I've heard of a few scenarios where people have tried to, you know, want to see some routine outside in the community, even before the, the uh, social isolation for autistic adults. And then they let it go, basically. And they, they were a little more understanding. Uh, I've only had a few examples, but they didn't, they didn't find people or whatever. And they can't do it somewhere. Need to do so or whatever. So I don't know. That's my that's my answer. Is uh, in some session, but not many kind of funny sessions. So autistic adults oh, and then to have. So. Matthew, your line your line is really cracking up, and we can't hear you. So um, let me let me just move on to Philip now, and hopefully you will find a location with a better reception. So so Philip, let me come mm. to you then. Could you um, give your thoughts on the question as part of your presentation. I will do. I'll start off with that question, actually, because I think it's a, it's a really important question at this point, uh, at all points. And my, my initial thoughts are quite simply, yes, the government imposed uh, a general lockdown, for instance, but how, how generally has that been felt? We've got different sections of the community, different people have experienced dif differences. For instance, some people have gardens, some people don't. So I think we need to realise that the, the, the blanket rule has not been applied to everybody in the same way. So it's been different experiences. And I think the other thing we must remember is human rights. And I think social work through this this this, this crisis, I've been, been quite impressed by the, the continued emphasis on human rights and, and the need to look at individuals and, and, and their rights uh, to, 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 to have, have expression and, 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 and lifestyle choices and families, for instance. So I think it's difficult to apply such a rule blanketly yet. And I think, as, as Matthew pointed out, there was an easement on, on that, that rule that the, the autistic people were allowed to go out more often than the one hour. But I think, again, applying something blanketly sort of affects people differently. And if I, if I bring it back to what social work is about, Social work to me is about assessment and, and social workers assess all sorts of people in all sorts of situations. I know other professionals too also. Social work work with social workers work with autistic people in both specialist teams like Matthews and also in more general teams, child care teams, adult care teams, for instance, who are accessing more general so social services. And social workers work in, in a range of different different areas, local authorities, health trusts, third sector agencies, for instance. And I think, as I say, social work is primarily concerned with uh, with assessment. And re recently, a colleague of myself, Kat Meredith, we, uh, we reflected on the three P's to assessment, which is purpose, process and product of social work assessments, which I think fits during this COVID situation and it fits also pre and post. So I think what I'd like to say is I think we can, for this, this webinar, is consider three distinct phases, if you like. There's pre-COVID-19, the current COVID-19 crisis, health crisis, and beyond this situation. And if you, if you look at the, the, the pre-COVID-19 current health crisis, and, and surveys talked about some of the the, 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 the situations where she, she misses, the services she misses, like short break, for instance. But the way autistic people were supporting her, their needs were understood, uh, what were really quite varied in many ways. And I think the evidence from research is uh, internationally is that social work, there was very little knowledge around how social work interacts and engage with, with autistic people. Now, I appreciate individual practitioners and agencies, agencies have a lot of information, but there just isn't that general knowledge in, in, in research, if you like. And I, I applauded and got involved in Baswa's capability statements for work with social work with autistic people. And I think this was a, was a step forward and, and we launched that pre-COVID. So I think that's a step forward. I think it's something unique to this country. So I think it's something really positive. I think we've also got this current COVID crisis and, and Sylvia and Matthew have reported on how this is going from a practitioner perspective and from, from a lived experience perspective. But I think also we need to think about what's going to happen next, how we go forward. And I think that that's really important. And each of these three stages, phases, if you like, involve social work assessments. I think we look at COVID-19, it's shown a light on people's vulnerabilities. 
I think we're seeing that in the TV every night. And I think really what, we, what, what we've seen through, it, it seems through the, the, the case mortality on, on COVID-19 is people who've got more health con health conditions are seem more vulnerable to 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 this this this, this virus affecting them more more, more seriously and, and I said the case mortality indicates people with health conditions are more likely to unfortunately uh, suffer as a consequence of that I think it's also mm -hmm. offered some reflection how we've assessed and supported people that, as Matthew mentioned there's been a, a this through our pace and I think mm -hmm. Because that's through our pace, it enables people to think a bit more, but also it really has shown a light on how people are vulnerable. And, and some of the work with Baswar on people with, with their own disability and, and autism, for instance, and mental health. And I think some of that work I've been involved in and that some of the practitioners I've, I've heard, I've actually really been impressed by how pra practitioners are really reflecting on how they can engage with people and work with people, how they can continue to support people. And also look at what previously did not work, you know, and, and, and how we sort of assessed people in a way that we felt was better for us. Sylvia mentioned gatekeeping and gaslighting, and I think assessments really need to be person-centred. What we need, what, what we've continued to do, what we missed, things like practical out and short breaks. If you look at before COVID-19, the United Nations inquiry found that uh, people with disabilities were disproportionately affected by UK austerity measures, for instance. We've also understood that autistic individuals report experience difficulties with social functioning and competence and social anxiety. We've also evidence around social isolation, anxiety about the future. Uh, many people have felt so social services focus on safeguarding and does not meet their needs, for instance. Uh, and private opportunities are much reduced for, for people who, who, who were diagnosed autistic. And there's no real practical reason for that because there's many skills and many people. And we, we've also seen how, for instance, uh, quite, I mean, 2004, uh, identified as a, a greater dependency on family support into adulthood. So we can see that there's, a, there's a differences uh, uh, which autistic people experience at the same time as survey I've already pointed out, once you met one autistic person, you met one autistic person. So, so, so Philip, uh, Philip just, just to bring back uh, to a point that you mentioned earlier on about assessments. Yep. Do you, do you think then that COVID-19 has had a, a, a sort of a, a fundamental impact on how social workers a should think about assessing the needs of autistic adults and b how they actually conduct those assessments in practice okay as matthew mentioned for the care act for instance definitely i, th I think as matthew mentions through remote assessments and, and of course the care act stipulates person-centered and, and, and strength-based approaches and a whole family approach and I, I think obviously we've had the COVID-19 had the, 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 the potential easement of the Care Act, uh, but not many authorities have taken that up because really there's, there's been tremendous attempts by practitioners to continue. I think assessment remotely, you cannot fully assess somebody remotely in, in the way that you can do it face to face. So you have to, I think, either it's a process, ticky box process, which doesn't work, because it doesn't provide a service and it, 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 it sort of only is seen from a service service provision perspective but if i'm going to work with people remotely we have to engage with them differently we have to trust their self-report reporting and their self-assessment we also and this is all in, in the care act we also have to look at a strength-based approach what works in people's lives rather than looking at a deficit-based approach and again that's in the care act and i think we also have to look at it, 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 a family approach and you know, a support network approach and how to support them if, if they're there, how, how we can do it. And I think that strengths approach to, to, to assessment is so important at this point, because yeah, I, I think- Yeah, and, and thank you for that, Philip. There's a, there's a, a question from, a, from a, an audience member here, and because it's about assessment, I think it's, it, it's, it's appropriate for you to, reflect on that in your presentation now. So it's, it's a question to the panel, but perhaps Philip, you can start with an answer. Do the panel think that social work is flexible enough to effectively support people with SEND if the way we assess people changes? 
I think we need to assess people differently, and I think we need. I mean, that depends on individual practitioners and agencies where practitioners work. But I think as a as a as a social worker myself, and with an autistic son. I think I implore people to assess people in their needs and, and look at their support needs and not focus on safeguarding. No, finish your point and I'll come back to Sylvia. Okay, and I think sort of because the, the tendency is, and I, I've done some work around uh, parents of children with special education needs, and what they identified was that when they, when they tried to access children services, for instance, unless they were were, were there were safeguarding issues. They found that uh, they, they found it difficult to access services, and quite often were were, were signposted towards the police. Not many parents want to report their cho children to the police. So I think we need to think when people are asking for support, what are they asking for? What do they identify as their needs? And I think that's all part of that strength-based approach to assessment. Thank you, Sylvia. Did you want to? Yeah, to, and to, I think and, and that's that, that's to. It's really in relation to SEND assessments. Yeah. 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 I um I think Philip said uh, quite a lot that's very important in that last bit. Is um I would like to see, um, and I think it should be almost the fourth emergency service. I would like to see autism specific social workers, um, um and learning dis learning disability specific social workers, um that are more easily accessed because as Philip said it, if you haven't if you don't fit their safeguarding um most of the time you're told you're not able to have a disability team because you're not dying or something I mean the, the gatekeeping around it is horrific and at the moment getting onto the police station I know a lot of families who where you've got one very tired adult no social care support and children with different needs the children are ending up in the police station and I think moving on these assessments if they were more robust and more uh, believing of the, the the individual and their carers and they're more flexible around that way done by people with more specific knowledge I think it would work better and I'll stop there because otherwise I will go on for a very long time about this okay thank you can very I just much. I totally agree with that Sylvia Thank you, Philip. Matthew, are you are you with us? Are you still with us? Yeah, you can hear me okay. We can yes. hear you now. So did you yeah. you hear those that question? It was about whether the panel thinks social work assessment is flexible enough to effectively support people with special education needs. Yeah, I can carry with everything said. I think um <clears throat> we have to be flexible enough. Uh, we have to I said earlier in my presentation, we have to be more collaborative in the way we work with people. So that means working with and trusting families more and trusting self-assessment, but also working with education colleagues. So the, we we have we have issues, and every team does working across teams. And sometimes it's misunderstanding. Sometimes we come from different places. But working together, we iron out those um, issues. And what we don't want to be doing is over assessing people either. So we go through a huge great process for educational and then social care comes along and does an assessment, which may or may not link into SMD. And it needs to be, it needs to. We need to have those processes smooth and there needs to be pathways to adulthood that are consistent across the methodology we used in the assessment forms and the plans we use. And at the moment it's a little bit chunky and a lot of work still needs to be done to make sure that you know we see people earlier and before adulthood and we can get people through you know, from 15, 16, when they're looking at their future lives and where they want to go next. Um, uh, we pick people up for 18 at the moment, it's not good enough. So we're, we're looking in Kent to try and see people earlier so we can smooth our SCND bit over. But how COVID affects that is the same for all assessment, I think. I think we are actually, you know, obliged to use this opportunity to review what does work. And we're probably not on a stage yet to say what is, what is perfect, but it's probably a mix of what we used to do and what we now do. I mean, there's probably a middle ground somewhere, but it's the best for everybody. And uh, it's going to take a lot of, it's going to be a lot of research and a lot of review after it finishes. What are you going to say, Sylvia? One thing yeah. I'd like to see, and it's very quick, Godfrey, I promise I won't run off on one. Um, I would like to see when the education, health care assessment's done, social care, not just sending back not known. I would like to see that every child that is assessed to an education and health care plan given a proper 
social care assessment timely and the whole thing working collaboratively and sharing and that's enough now i think that's a really helpful point thank you very much um philip I, this is a, a question from for you but actually because all the panel were involved with the development of the capability statement i think we we can all have something to say about that um and this is how going back to the capability statements how philip you think that can influence the way local authorities provide training and cpd for social workers other providers use cpd uh, as a capability statement for training and also how social work universities can adopt the capability statements in the training of social workers and of course there's the mandatory training aspect of this to consider as well and that's uh -huh. nice it. I, th I think I think we've got an opportunity through the capability statements, uh, statements really through Boswell, to actually really influence practice, influence practice through training, influence practice through agents adopting, ad adopting those capability statements. And because they're linked into to the PCFs, they, they are part of the, the educational process I'm involved in. We teach with the PCFs, but the, the capability statements look at how we can, can apply them to different areas of practice. And in this one, it's upskilling practitioners and how to engage with and work with people who are autistic. And I think that's really important that we co-produce and work with people, work in a strength-based manner, and actually uh, negotiate how we communicate. For instance, and I, I'll say one final thing, Sylvia mentioned she doesn't make telephone calls. So it's really important that we don't just assume people will accept the phone call. They may do, they may not. We need to talk, and that's about trust, which Matthew's talked about. And Sylvia's shown why we should trust people. And I think also we've got the special interest group, which uh, uh, Godfrey mentioned at the beginning. That That is going to move forward, hopefully, a lot of the questions people have and, and really upscale people in our knowledge, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I know you were you were involved in the development of the capability statement. Can you say something about your expectations of how these practice frameworks can assist in training social workers really to make them more skillful in their roles? Well, I'm I'm hoping that social workers read it, and I'm hoping that they talk about it. And I'm hoping that they reflect on it in individual everyday practice. So make it the centre of what they're doing when they're um, learning to communicate with us and help us live well. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and I, I think that's a really important point that actually COVID is an emergency. We need to see it as an emergency, but the long standing understanding and accepted mm. way of good social work practice with autistic adults still remains really and those are embodied in the capability statement thank you matthew did you want to add to that as a, as a manager of social workers how do you how do you see the the capability statement supporting good social work practice in terms of cpd and training yeah, I think it's really important because <clears throat> we've got a mix of uh, mixed economy at the moment of social work provision. We've got some limited autism specific teams. We shouldn't really be autism, should it? It should be neurodevelopmental per se. And then you got other teams where there's like a generic approach to everybody. And there's other teams where, you know, autistic specific support is in, um, is in mental health services or land disability services. So it's a real mixed economy at the moment. So that's where you definitely need things like like the uh, framework because people who work who have different levels of um of responsibility or support or you need to need a varying levels of understanding so that's where the framework's been really useful to break down whether where those levels are a little bit and what's needed what people need to know what in what context so if you did go and i wouldn't say anyone should do this if anyone any local authority went to generic offer then you need to know quite a lot about, you know, how to support someone with learning disabilities, how to support someone with autism and mental health. Because if you don't, you can't do a thorough assessment or a care act, can you really? I know we're on our time now. Yeah, so so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, to, to, to our audience, uh, really engaging audience, thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is this is all the time we have to, for the webinar, but please look out for a follow-up email from Baswa, um, we will alert you 
to the when the recording of this webinar is posted on the website and there will also be other resources on learning disability on autism accompanying the recording so check the Basra website for that on behalf of all our panelists um, and also my colleagues who you can't see but are in the background supporting us but today in shares and Steph Davis, thank you very much for supporting the webinar. And to our audience, we look forward to you joining us again for another Basra webinar. Goodbye. My name is Gottfried Bauer. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Bye.